Hey guys, welcome to Seeing Blind. My name is Cindy. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining me. I have two awesome guests with me this evening. I'm very stoked to introduce them to you all. It's going to be an awesome conversation this evening about coping skills and strategies. Whether you are disabled, you have one disability, multiple disabilities, if you have some trauma in your past, whatever the situation may be, we are going to talk some general um, best case uh, strategies and skills to help you cope, overcome, and manage to live your best healthy life. So that is tonight's goal and objectives for this conversation. But as always, you never know where these blind community chats are gonna go. It's all about having fun, raising awareness, educating each other and promoting community and connection um, among us, not just in the blind community, but also in the general population of dis individuals with disabilities. It is Disability Pride Month, y'all. So happy disability pride month to you guys if you are in that group i am uh i've been trying to upload a lot of videos here lately just to kind of help contribute um to that and celebrate that in my own way here on the channel speaking of the channel guys if you haven't yet subscribed double check make sure that you have and double check the notification bell that's going to let you know when these live chats start each evening uh, when I do them. It's spontaneous. It's sporadic because y'all know I have kids <laughs> and they always make life very difficult to keep to a schedule. So um, make sure all those good buttons are pushed down below for me. And um, I'm going to give um, a few more of my current subscribers just a few minutes to get those notifications right now and join us in the live uh, stream chat. So if you are already in here with us, guys, please put that in the chat box. Say hello. Tell us how you're doing tonight. Tell us, you know, are you, do you have a disability? What it is? Are you blind like me? Or do you have anything else going on? Um, I think a lot of the times, sometimes blindness is kind of, the major sort of disability and it kind of we end up forgetting to recognize some of the other ones like for example i have adhd and i forget to tell people that hey there's a reason why i tend to like jump in and, and like interrupt and never stay on task um and so make sure that you definitely validate and acknowledge all the issues that you're managing and coping with because that is part of the game um, making sure you're acknowledging everything on your plate so um i am going to tune into the chat for a little while and let these wonderful beautiful ladies introduce themselves this evening so laura i'm going to turn it over to you will you please tell us who you are what your goals and mission is right now and and what you're advocating for and just um, all that stuff and real quick guys you can find all of their links and information as soon as the stream ends i will put their links how you can find them, contact them down in the description box. So if you don't see it there now, be sure to check it out later. Um, and I'll probably try to put them in the comment section after the stream is over as well. So uh, Laura, go ahead. Hi, Cindy, Jojo, thank you so much for having me this evening. I really appreciate being a part of this conversation. Um, so I, uh, my name is Laura Miller and I use she, her pronouns. Um, mm -hmm. I am a blind sex educator and researcher in our community, um, and I can tell you a little bit more about the work I do, um, but I am also a mom. I have a 13-year-old, and I have um, permission to tell certain stories and I'm strictly forbidden from telling other stories, <laughs> so you might yeah. hear some of those. Um, yeah. okay. I identify as queer and I'm also raising my son in an ethical non-monogamous relationship. Um, have two wonderful partners here in the Bay Area and um, am excited about the pandemic opening up and um, getting back out into the world again. So um, let's see about my blindness. I have retinitis pigmentosa and have tunnel vision. Um, 
I was diagnosed 18 years ago and for about 13 of those years had a really negative attitude towards blindness and for the last five have been able to turn that around and have a really positive attitude towards blindness. So um, the messages that I really want to promote are um, around um, accessible sex education for the blind community and really the disabled community at large, but definitely the project I'm working on focuses on blind folks and also creating a culture of consent um, in, in all of the spaces that we may find ourselves as disabled folks. So that's in our community mm -hmm. spaces, that's in the medical care provider spaces, that's in the training and education spaces. So really working on building a culture of consent. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, Jojo. Well, thank you for having me. Um, sure. My name is Joanne, but I go by Jojo. Um, I think I have been my entire life. Um, I have had uh, quite the traumatic and chaotic childhood. Um, I was born with multiple birth defects, you know, this was back in 87. So they didn't really know all the diseases that they do, you know, with modern technology now. Um, mm. So I grew up pretty much not realizing the severity of everything. I had the starting symptoms of retinitis pigmentosa as well. And I was also considered deafblind. And I didn't realize that like the doctors didn't tell me, and I guess they didn't really know, <laughs> um, but they didn't tell me that deaf blind people eventually, like if you're born, you know, visually impaired and uh, hard of hearing, you eventually lose your hearing and sight by the time you're an adult. And I didn't know hmm. that that was a common thing for people that were deaf blind, um, depending on the severity of the multitude of uh, disabilities that they have, because if you're deaf blind, you also have a lot more going on than meets the eye. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but I've noticed that's a common thing for people that are deaf blind. I also have um, coffin McCusick syndrome that was diagnosed right after I found out about the RP and mm, that I found out that, that I was losing my hearing. Um, coffin McCusick is one of the rarest um, genetic disorders. It's, um, let's, let's put it this way. When I was a kid, so when I was born in 87, there was 10 people that had it, including myself. And now because of the, the severity of the disease, you don't live long. You have a very short lifespan. So mm -hmm. now I would say there's three of us left because the oh doctors goodness. kept yeah the doctors kept telling me that I would I would not survive past 3 past 5 past 10 and by the time I was 10 my dad's like um I don't think she's going to go anywhere <laughs> <laughs> I think she's meant to be here um yeah. like my 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 family is um hispanic uh we come from a a lot of different backgrounds I'm also part french but we came from spain going to uh going to Mexico to live a better life. And then obviously from Mexico to America, um, I'm also Native American. So it's a lot of push pull when it comes to science and medicine, because a lot of the older generation believes that, you know, uh, it's a hoax. It's all about money. Um, it doesn't exist. But in reality, a lot of my family doesn't want to admit that, you know, there's a lot of incest in our family. I am um, mm. a product of incest, so that is why I have so many rare diseases that, you know, doctors really can't do anything about. Um, I also it. have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and that I have the, I have the most severest case. I have uh, vascular Ehlers-Danlos, and because of the coffin McCusick, when you have more than one disability or more than one ailment, what ends up happening is they fight each other. Mm. So you become exhausted. So on top of the RP, on top of all of that, my body is so physically exhausted. You're working yes. your, your body 10 times harder because it's not working. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, with the other stainless, your body literally is dying from the inside out. So with my skin, it's extremely thin. So if I bump into something, because I'm blind, um, if I bump into something, I basically tear something in my skin. I don't bruise. 
um, I tear. Some people with others okay. those bruise, I just tear because the skin is so thin. Um, right. And then I'm losing my hair, so I'm pretty much bald. Um, I've had to do like a buzz cut under, like I only have like one layer, so I've had to do like uh -huh. a buzz cut to try and like even it out. Um, so that yeah. worked. <laughs> um, yeah. Then I started doing like wigs and extensions because a lot of my a lot of my supporters on my channel and my brand, they thought that it would help like improve the confidence type deal. Um, so with the other standalones, that's, you know, basically the most temperamental. Um, and I go through, you know, spouts of losing more and more vision, more and more hearing. And then they like, it's like a domino effect for myself. Um, I also uh, dealt with um, a lot of severe abuse and neglect. Um, to this day, I have to have it out with my mom because she's in denial of the fact mm. that she wasn't there, the fact that she wasn't a good mom, the fact that, you know, it, it's like a generational sin and curse at the same time within our family. There's a lot of violence, there's a lot of incest, a lot of pedophilia, a lot of just things that people don't want to talk about. Um, that's a lot of things that I talk about on my channel as well, because yeah. I feel like if we don't speak out on it, it's never going to end. And there's a lot of, um, I was also, uh, unfortunately, I had to endure sex trafficking, unfortunately, within my own family. Um, my father was a pedophile. It happened to him. So it's a hit in, in a predator's, mm -hmm. in a predator's excuse, they, they want to say, be, oh, well, I was hurt. So I get to do it to you. And then you have to repeat that pattern. I chose to break the cycle. So I was considered mm -hmm. the odd man out, um, because I chose to break a cycle. Unfortunately, the background that I, I have is, uh, satanic. Unfortunately, they, they did the rituals. They did all of the seances, yeah. everything. I had to witness yeah. a lot of horrible things on the holidays. I've had to witness um, a lot of the agendas play out that's happening to this day uh, with everything that's going on in the world. Um, I was forced to read the Satanic Bible. I was, and that's in Latin. And old Latin is really harder than old English. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was forced to, you know, do a lot of things that I didn't want to witness, forced to do a lot of things that I didn't want to do. Um, so it was, it was uh, gruesome, it was, you know, graphic, it was violent, and a lot of the times I thought I was going, you know, I had so many severe disabilities that I didn't know, we didn't know what was what, so I could have easily yeah. passed away. Um, so I was grateful every single time that, you know, even though it was severe and it was gruesome and it was gory, I was just grateful to, you know, find ways to deal with it. Um, so how, what are some of those ways that you, what are some, like, how did you cope with uh, that? When that, I, well, that is some heavy, yeah, heavy yeah. background. Yeah, when I was a kid, um, when, when you're a child, a lot of parents don't understand this. When um, when you're a child, and, and I've had to explain this to so many, so many parents, um, especially those that have, their, their kids have severe trauma, their kids have severe um uh what's it called like like you know just severe mental illness in general um mm. a lot of parents don't realize that it doesn't matter what the child is going through whether whether it's a divorce in the family um whether it's neglect whether it's abuse whether it's just bullying you know um a lot of things are trauma it doesn't have to be as severe as mine uh what ends up happening is the child blames themselves and there's a lot of shame that comes with that and you're afraid to speak. Um, I, I yeah. was fortunate enough to advocate for myself, even as a child. I spoke out. Good for you. That's hard. I spoke out. I told, I, I told so many adults. I even told my mom at one point, and she didn't hear me. She didn't want to hear me. She told me, you don't have a mm -hmm. choice. She, you know, called me the R word a lot. Like, I was bullied a lot. I was tormented by my own family. Um, I was told a lot of horrible things. Um, mm. And they want to think, they want to believe that, you know, I just need to get over it. Like a lot of people, this is just people in general. A lot of people want want those that deal with complex PTSD to just get over it and suck it up. And the, the number yeah, one they, phrase, the number one phrase that I absolutely hate, and this is just for me, is you got this. 
Like, it's okay to not be okay. People are suffering yes. every single day, yeah. disability yeah. or not. Like, you don't have to throw it in our face that suck it up. Like, that's to me, that's just another way of saying that. Yeah. Um, but for when I was a kid, I used to blame myself a lot. Um, but I would, I would often find different ways. Art was one of my escapes. Um, I, I went back and art so, or um, what painting, what kind drawing, of okay, painting, so drawing, arts, yes. any any basic uh, medium that I could get my hands on, pastels, yeah, um, charcoals. But when for, it was ironic because I went through a lot with my family because I, I unfortunately had to go through the misconception of not knowing what was real with their emotions towards me and then what was delusion. So I grew mm. up confused. You grow up, yeah. you grow up really confused as a child, especially when you have to deal with abuse and then the parent one minute acts one way and then the next minute they're nice to you. Do you see what I'm saying? So oh, yeah, I, grew up really, I grew up really, really confused. Um, so I grew up with that and like, I had to deal with a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. By the time I was nine years old, I was hallucinating and didn't know why. Um, and a neurologist, neurologist told me later on in life that hallucinations are just the brain's way of protecting itself. It's not, it's nothing about, it's not, it's not as dangerous as psychiatrists want to make it believe. As long as you're not acting out on what the hallucinations are saying and you're dealing and you're coping with that, like it's, it's not a dangerous thing. Um, it's just your brain's way of protecting itself. So I ended up you know, going back and forth between good coping skills and then really, really severe. Um, when I was six, I started uh, pretty much, you know, painting, drawing. I would, I, I was a tomboy, so I played outside. So I wasn't like the normal yeah. girl in my neighborhood because I grew up in Chicago and a lot of the girls in my neighborhood were girly girls. I never wore skirts, but but a lot of it was me protecting myself because I was, you know, being violated so yeah a lot of the things that i went through i did it to protect myself um i also mm -hmm. struggled with an eating disorder that runs severely in my family i had uh when i was it started when i was three when i was three it was like a self-soothing mechanism because i didn't walk or talk or speak until i was three so mm. i would get frustrated and it was like a form of self-harm because i would hurt myself because i would get frustrated like I yeah. can't, I can't literally, literally cannot do anything. Yeah, um, that was something you could control. Right, exactly. And I remember my grandmother saying, "You need to like," because my dad was screaming at me, and he's like, "She was like, you need to, like, you need to leave her alone." He's just, she's like, she can't talk, she can't walk, she can't do anything, and she can't defend herself. Wouldn't you be upset? I, she, she's like, I would be upset. I would be frustrated. Yeah. Like, as long as she's not severely hurting herself, like, just let her express herself. She's that's all she's doing. So in order for me to get what I needed, I had to, like, I made, like, grunt noises. Like, I made different sounds so that my parents could figure out if I was hungry, if I was tired, mm -hmm. if I was, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So it was yeah. just, yeah. it was frustrating. Um, so it started with pica. For those who don't know, pica is one of the rarest eating disorders that a lot of people don't talk about. Um you're consuming an object and it's like a self-soothing technique and you'd rather just eat that object whether it's it could be ashes from the ashtray it could be the wood pickings of the side of the house it could be chalk interesting it could be those types of things and what it is is it's soothing and a lot of my family was making fun of me about it and my aunt had mentioned my aunt and my grandmother had mentioned our mother did that our mother did the exact same thing. She, what Joanne is eating, our mother did the exact same thing. And we, we would ask her, why are you doing that? Because they would freak out, right? So she's like, why are you doing that? She's like, I can't help it. It's soothing me. So a lot of that stuff, like a lot of mental illness, a lot of that runs in our family, but the family doesn't want to acknowledge that. So to me, if they're not going to benefit me, I'm not going to, you know, you're not going to be in my life. But a lot of the... A lot of that, because uh, I, I went through that over like over the year, course of the years, and then when I was five, I started developing anorexia. Like I would restrict my calories. Um, and if this triggers people, I apologize. But 
for me, numbers don't trigger me because I've been recovered for 12 years now with the eating disorder. But um, what what end up what ended up happening was I I don't know what made possessed me to think of this number um, was 120 calories. And if you don't know what 120 calories, 200 calories is the equivalent of half of a sandwich. So imagine what 120 is. Not much. Yeah, yeah. That it's really you, not much. Yeah, you can't. You, yeah, uh, right. Um, yeah. You can't so, even. Yeah, I don't see how right. you functioned on that. Uh, I did it for so many years. I I don't even know how I survived. I almost died many many times as a teenager, as a and as a young adult. My organs were shutting down because it's dangerous for someone like myself with Dallas Danlos with. Um, the brain because i was born with brain damage as well like there's, there's so many things going on i shouldn't be hurting myself you see what i'm saying so yeah so i i think you know that that, that brings us to you know and i think a lot of times when right. we are trying to manage and cope with so much it's easier to fall on unhealthy coping strategies and skills yeah you know, before, because sometimes the healthy ones take more effort. It takes more work. It takes more mental awareness and, and presence and, um, intent to. Sometimes it just doesn't work either. Like you're trying to yeah. do the, the good ones, but it's just easier and more self-soothing to do the more lethal and dangerous and yeah. destructive yeah. ones. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And, and I mean, like most things in life, you know, sometimes the easiest path, it's just, it's easier, but it's not always the better choice. Right. It's not right. always the healthiest decision. But yeah, there's so many people I've heard that's extremely common, um, you know, if finding yourself struggling with an eating disorder, because, you know, what I feel like, when we're struggling with coping and managing things, everything in our life and on our plate, whether we want to face them, think about them, whether we're in denial, we're avoiding, we're ignoring, it's like we're feeling, we feel out of control. We can't, right. we want to gain control back of our life. And sometimes the only way we can do so is going back to the basic needs, the high, the Pavlov's um, hierarchy of needs and, you know, food, water, shelter, safety, security, and sometimes just going back to the bare basics and controlling that is where people start finding, you know, well, I can control what I eat. So the next thing you know, they end up going down that eating disorder path in efforts of trying to gain control over their life again. And, um, it is, yeah, I mean, that that one, unlike like so many, are such slippery, slippery so, slopes. Um, Laura, I want to give you a chance to chime in here. Um, what are your thoughts um, as far as unhealthy coping? Do you have any experiences or any um, anything that you can contribute since we're kind of in that unhealthy coping <laughs> and before we move forward with the, the positives? Um, certainly. And I um, forgot to share at the beginning, too, I also have multiple disabilities. And um, but before, before I go in to answer your question, I actually just want to say, Jojo, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it's um, incredibly brave to do so, so openly, and mm -hmm. um, even more so just to highlight the resilience of your story. Um, there's a lot of power in your share and um, some of the things that you have done to cope. And um, just to piggyback off the very tail end of that conversation, sometimes it's not easy for us to choose healthy coping strategies because we've never been taught them. We've never had healthy yeah. models. And so that's so much of like where I want to come in with the conversation of consent into our community. And so I wanna be really careful here because Consent is, I believe, the tool that will help reduce a significant amount of harm that takes place in our community around sexual assault and, and abuse and misconduct. But it will not stop um, several of the people in JoJo's case who are perpetrators and who right. are out to cause harm. And so I just, I just want to preface before I share um, that I'm very aware of that and we need to acknowledge that and make sure that we also hold space for survivors to talk about consent after harm has, has taken place too. So um, um, a little bit about my background and um, 
why I do this work is um, I'm also a survivor and um, I there's many different ways to respond to trauma like you all were, were talking about. But one of the, new, there's um, the fight, flight and freeze, which most people are familiar with. But what I experienced through the um, abuse that I um, took place was the fawning, the compliance, the going along, the good girl. Um, and I actually took a lot of that trauma response into my early days of blindness. And so um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that there's all of these ways that, that trauma can, can occur in the body. But in, in my case, one of the things that was so hard for me to start speaking publicly as a survivor was that I felt complicit in that abuse. I felt like somehow I shared a role in what happened. And, mm -hmm. and that is a trauma response. That is fawning. That is making sure I am protected and safe and taken care of while all of this is happening. And in my early healing days, I did not get enough of those messages. Um, I also grew up sighted, but in East Africa, in a bit of an information desert. So I needed and wanted a lot of information about um, sex, about my body, about abuse, but I had no access to it. Um, and so it's something that I could actually really relate to when I started working in our community later about the lack of materials. Um, and so it really did drive the, the work that I am doing. Um, growing up in, in an information desert doesn't necessarily lead to healthy sexuality. Um, yeah. And so that's really important. And then the other piece that I wanted to share from the introduction um, is I also have multiple disabilities and sometimes blindness, not sometimes, most of the time, blindness trumps those yeah. disabilities. and. Um, that actually, um, while I have learned a lot from blindness, um, it, it's important to acknowledge the whole of me and all of the parts. Exactly. And so I'm somebody who has general anxiety disorder. Um, you know, even before needing to do a presentation, um, have to do lots of grounding techniques. This is an informal chat. It's just us having a, a conversation and getting mm -hmm. our thoughts out there into the community and I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> um, oh, bless and, your heart. <laughs> and so for me, taking that trauma and being able to talk anywhere about the importance of consent, the importance of talking about our bodies and in positive ways um, is healing for me. And so that's a huge part of why I do this work. Um, I also have recently been diagnosed with um, lichen sclerosis, which is actually a disorder that affects my, my genitals and my sex life. And that has been really difficult, except that I knew from my experience with 13 years of not wanting to do anything with blindness and then five years of blind positivity, I knew on day two of this diagnosis that I needed community. I needed people mm. who had gone through this disease, who knew how to manage it, who knew how to get back to pleasure and enjoying life again. Um, that has certainly been a journey, but those, those um, early messages I got with blindness, I thought I needed to fix it. I thought I needed a cure. I went the fundraising route. I was deep in my internalized ableism thinking this is the worst thing that could happen. And really it was when I got into community that I saw blind people living their lives and having really positive experiences. And um, I wanted some of that. So I, I certainly have um, been able to combine the blind positive messages that blindness is not what holds us back, that we can have the lives we want. Um, I can pretty much be anything that I want, even a NASCAR race car driver, if I would like to at this point. Um, and um, um, layering that with my message about consent has also been a huge tool in how I go through the world. And so, um, as you said, the the trauma responses, they can be really huge. The abuse that Jojo uh, laid out, that's 
serious lifetime trauma. And it can be really small, but significant at the same time. Maybe you're being grabbed on the street or somebody is trying to guide you through a doctor's office in a way that makes you uncomfortable. And so being able to navigate those conversations with a consent framework has um, given myself and other people um, tools to sort of help them. So um, I think I'm going to stop there. Ask, <laughs> I was about to say, I'm going to, I, you have piqued my curiosity here. I have an important uh, question to ask you to, um, but real quick, I want to say hello to everyone in the chat. You guys, I can tell are just kind of listening. There's not a whole lot going on there, but I just wanted to say hi to, to Mew Mew Q and um, uh, Corey Walker and everyone else that is in here. Uh, in the chat, um, welcome you guys. So my question to you ladies is, is I, so I had no, you know, and grand this, it's very serendipitous how you two have joined together tonight um, for this conversation. Uh, and, and I think it's really something, it just clearly meant to be. And I think it's so important because there needs to be more awareness. And I feel like there is a movement going on right now trying to raise more awareness um, that people and those of us with disabilities especially in the blind vip community because we are technically really in many ways not able to visually identify any attackers or any um, perpetrators or anyone who wants to do us harm sometimes um, because of that misconception and misunderstanding do you guys feel that um, in our within specifically just the general population of individuals with disabilities, we are more at risk or a higher target of these types of crimes and the harm done to us? Definitely. So I <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So Jojo, Jojo, you say definitely. Yes. Real quick. OK, um, Laura, what's your quick response there? Yeah, I mean, I do. Yeah, I okay. do think that we have, and whether or not it puts us at higher risk, because I can, I can certainly hear the people, people saying no, but a much larger majority of folks, and the research shows that people with disabilities do experience sexual violence and trauma at a much higher rate um, than non-disabled folks. I do think it's really important, um, and I feel like I'm just about to lose my train of thought. Um, no worries. It is really important that we do not <laughs> just focus on whether or not we can identify our assailants because most abuse and most, um, a majority of sexual misconduct actually happens with folks that we know. And in the, um, one of the, uh, the National Federation of the Blind just did a survey with RAIN and it was a large percentage of, um, people who responded to that survey said that they did not file a code of conduct report because they could not identify if what happened to them was in fact abuse. And I think mm. that, that is a really telling problem as well, that we need to have a conversation in our community about what se sexual misconduct is, about what abuse is, um, and about how to handle that. And so, yes, we definitely are at risk. And also I think that the agencies and organizations that serve us can do a lot to help and enhance this conversation by making sure that all of the policies, all of the procedures are, are very clear and protective and um, building a culture of consent. So I just, I just wanted to add that into the conversation. I totally agree. Yeah, I think, um, so I'm currently, um, you know, one of the things I've been sort of discussing on my my channel recently is just i'm just now starting in my new state of tennessee working with the rehabilitation center here just trying to gain some new training some new skills as i've recently lost a lot more of my own vision and i think it is so important i don't recall in the list of things that i could gain you know training tech you know whatever you know in this uh, in my goal of of gaining more um, and skills and adapting and everything, I don't think thing. I have lost your sound. I, I don't hear anything either. 
Uh oh. <laughs> Definitely have lost your sound. Yeah. Uh oh. I will take one second. You, it looks like you are muted. Um, but I will go ahead and just say one thing about Department of Rehab while it is on my mind. I was on a call recently where they were asking us um, what, asking for uh, the community's opinion on how rehab can help address sexual misconduct. And um, I have been a consumer of rehab off and on for about 18 years. And in those 18 years, I have never once been asked to evaluate or give my feedback about a provider in our community. And I think that is incredibly important to make sure that once somebody has come into your home or done some training that the government is paying for, that we're asking those people you know, did they get good value out of that training? Would they recommend that trainer again? Would they recommend a person to a friend? I really think that um, folks who are um, are at least working in the blind community and perpetuating misconduct, that Department of Rehab has an advocacy role here um, to help. So, yeah, that that reminds me of of uh, when we first started going into um, rehabilitation to learn like just, you know, the basic things, um, O and M, uh, just learning Braille. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember the person, the, the woman that we had that was helping us. I remember she was, I, she was very impatient and she was yelling at my mom and my mom, um, was in her forties. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I had just, I mean, I got diagnosed right after my, right after my, uh, eighth grade graduation. So I was, you know what I mean? I was young, mm -hmm. um, but I was upset that this person was yelling at her and I went off on her. I'm like, okay, why are you yelling at her? We're new at this. Like you're act like we, like you, you're getting frustrated and you act like we are supposed to know what we're doing. We're new at this. We went yeah. from having sight to now we have to adjust to not having sight. Shouldn't you be more you patient? Hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Well, I can hear you. <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I was just explaining because she had just mentioned about, you know, like trying to not only figure out the reviews of other uh, instructors as far as like the rehabilitation for people that are blind. Um, I was just mentioning that my, I remember my mom being yelled at when we first got diagnosed because I got diagnosed at 13. She got diagnosed um, in her forties. So it's like, oh. we got diagnosed back to back. And um, I remember the instructor just being really rude and just like going off. And then I'm like, you should have more patience than this, because not only are we new at this, you're trying to control the narrative. You want us to do things your way. We have, we can't do that. Yeah. We have more than one disability. We have to learn how to do it ourselves. Like I already knew, like I grew up, strategizing that's what i that's what i considered it i had to figure out how to live my life because i had way too many disabilities and way too many restrictions you know what i'm saying so mm -hmm. i had to do things my own way and a lot of people that are you know quote unquote normal that's what i call it um don't have a disability or never understood from that aspect get impatient with you and it's like you're gonna have to either live with it or walk away because we have to do things our own way. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. you know, I mentioned, I mentioned to my mom, I'm like, you know, you can stand up for yourself, right? Yeah. You know, you don't have to listen to that, right? And she, my mom was like shocked and impressed and awed because she's like, okay, how are you this feisty and you're only 13 years old? <laughs> like, how are you? How are you doing the job that I'm supposed to be doing? I'm the mm -hmm. adult, and I it's like you know more than I do, and just it's like this is a, this is insane. <laughs> I'm like, but you don't have a choice. You have to advocate for yourself. If you don't like her, you can switch her. Mm -hmm. it, sh it shouldn't be that difficult. So that's that's what that reminded me of. That you know, there I didn't realize that there aren't like like accountability actions mm -hmm. that come along with that. I didn't realize that because I just told my mom or just you know just call the agency. Like, what else can we do? You know. So and in JoJo's story, there's there's such an abuse of power and I do yeah. a lot of 
conversations with teachers of the blind and visually impaired and parents of the blind and visually impaired and leaders who work in the blind and visually impaired community. And at the basis of all consent violations is a power dynamic. And until we start talking about those power dynamics and how easily they are abused and, and um, how quickly it takes away somebody's agency, it has the exact opposite of what we're actually wanting to do as educators. And so, yeah, so important to talk about those power dynamics. You are going through a life-changing experience. You are trying to learn the skills you need. And this person is using their power in a way that they that is bullying because, and many times, maybe they just might be a, a total um, jerk. Let me use a nice word. <laughs> or sometimes in um, teachers may really push or, or sort of really um, make students uncomfortable to try to get them to learn. And it's just totally unnecessary. It's a misuse of power. It leads to distrust. It leads to a trauma response and students not being able to learn. So um, yeah, Jojo, thank you. It's just uh, consent and power, such an important part of, of this conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. I, um, sorry, I'm trying to like mess with my camera right now, guys. <laughs> so like, don't look at my screen right now, y'all. But um, what I was saying is like, you know, yeah, there's there's no education in the part of the rehabilitation process when you're entering into the workforce, when you're entering into, you know, learning the skills to be mobile in society again, there, it's like you when you go to work, you know, there's always all these kind of harassment trainings and all this kind of stuff. But there's not any regarding those of us who are disabled or specifically blind, visually impaired I, that I know of that is specific to managing it when people are trying to take advantage by utilizing your disability against you. So, um and, and how people can do that. It's kind of like, like you were saying earlier, um, you were like, you were trying to please, you were trying to, or they, or they, they like you were saying, the study was like, oh, there, people weren't sure uh, if that was the case or not. And it's like, you're left with a sense of doubt. And so then you end up questioning, but yet you feel uncomfortable. And so, and, but there's just, you are totally right, Laura, in that there is not enough education. There's not enough material. There's not enough awareness out there specifically regarding these types of um, managing these types of issues when it comes to our population um, in the world of disability. So thank you all so much. I mean, I, I just want to take a second real quick and, and acknowledge how the value that you guys are bringing to our community this evening and not just through this conversation but all the work that you guys are doing i really hope everyone checks out your all's websites your links your pages um to and really helps share your all's content out so that we can get these messages heard so we can raise this awareness and and teach people that hey this happens more than people realize. And you are so right, uh, Jojo, when you were talking about that, people don't wanna hear it. They want, they would rather be dismissive. They would rather ignore it they, because it makes them feel uncomfortable or because they just flat out cannot mentally and emotionally themselves go there. And so they push it away or they just you know want to avoid it. And it's important that we stop that, that we stop enabling it's because it's not okay. And it and we do need these voices heard. And we do need to understand that this still happens mm -hmm. more than we realize. And it needs to stop. It's not okay. And I um, the research is there, Laura. You Laura, you are correct. The re I don't know the latest statistics. I probably am gonna go research all this right now because I'm so mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm curious and I'm, I'm very passionate and you all have like put a fire under my butt on this now because um, <laughs> I want to I want to know like and, and last I heard I know the disabled population is more at risk and you hear but 
rarely are we going to report it. I feel like um, so much goes unreported. Uh, so I, I can only yeah. imagine just how often it happens because so many voices are silenced. So um, so let's let, let's talk about some of the healthy uh, coping things that we can. What what are some of the positive things that those of us who are disabled like? Um, what can we do? What um, so Jojo, you mentioned art and things like that. I myself am a musician. I'm a knitter. I'm, I I run when I, my kids let me. You know, I, there's a lot of things that I have done to try to keep myself healthy mentally. Um, health, healthy and such, but there's so many different ways that we can cope, not just in hobbies and uh, extracurricular activities and things like that. So let's just open this up. There's a huge uh, world here of healthy coping options. Um, what, what do you guys think about here? What do you all suggest? What's worked for you? Um, well, for me, uh, dealing with so many uh, comor comorbidity, uh, mental illnesses, as well as, uh, so many addictions. Um, I am currently 12 years recovered from an eating disorder and seven years clean, six years sober and five years self-harm free. Um, it mm. took a lot of years to get to where I am today. If you were to tell me 10 years ago that I would be here today, not struggling and all of these um, triggers and the constant, cause the PTSD never goes away. Like it's constant flashbacks, certain things trigger me. Yeah. I feel bad for my husband sometimes because I'll, sometimes mm -hmm. it, it rarely happens um, anymore, but sometimes the intimacy, it'll trigger something and he takes it personal and he wants to blame himself, but it's like, I have to remind him, it's not your fault that I had, you know, a jerk for a father. It's not your fault that he was, he chose, he chose to be an animal. Like, that's not mm. your fault. Yeah. Um, so I have to reassure him that it's okay. You know what I mean? It's not your fault. It's not, it's got nothing to do with you. Um, so it, not only did it take me years to, realized that I was worth recovery because a lot of times people, whether you, you know, a lot of people, I've noticed that a lot of people with disabilities um, oftentimes don't want to admit that they're struggling um, because it's, it's kind of like a catch 22 because you don't want to admit that you're, that you have an ailment, right? You don't want to admit to the world that you're disabled because you know, you're vulnerable, you know, you're going to get taken advantage of. Um, mm -hmm. That's just, that's just a given when it comes to people with disabilities and so then he goes back and forth between, okay, and if I decide to, you know, just be vulnerable and, and be open and just not be afraid. Um, I have taught so many people in my lifetime that you have to tell people what you have. Um, I remember getting scrutinized in, as a teenager because I wasn't afraid to say that I had, you know, a mental illness. Um, mm. A lot of people still have that stigma of, oh, it's a horrible thing. Oh, you're a horrible person. No, I've gone through a lot of trauma that I don't really, really want to speak on. But that's just my way of saying I've been through a lot. Like saying you have a mental illness is just another way of saying you've been through a lot. Um, so in order to develop the, the, what I found is in order to, to develop the good coping skills, you have to replace the bad ones with something positive. So mm. um, I had to accept where my life was at when it came to the trauma, that that's never going to go away. I had to accept all of the disabilities and just adjust each time I lost vision, each time, you know, my body deteriorates because I have to adjust to that as well. Um, yeah. I used to, I, I mean, I had a lot of good coping skills, but then the disabilities gets in the way. So I was able to run I went from running nine to 10 miles a day. That was my, that, that was my antidepressant. That's, that yeah, was my antidepressant. That's, that was my anti-anxiety. Um, and I felt amazing afterwards. My husband couldn't believe how fast I could run. And then I, I would do nine to 10 miles in less than two hours. 
less than two hours. Wow. Um, but a lot of the things that I, I was able, like, I can't work out anymore that can set off like my aorta and I could, you know, have a heart failure from that. So mm-hmm. I'm not able to work out. Um, so for a lot of people that, you know, are disabled, they need to realize what they can and can't do and they can't push their body as well. So I've had to switch over the years a lot of what I'm able to do and what's feasible and what's not going to hurt <laughs> in the yes. end. Yes. Um, so I'm, I, I wasn't, I actually wasn't able to do art for two years um, because I couldn't sit for a long time. I couldn't, um, I couldn't hold the paintbrush for a long time. I couldn't draw without my hand cramping up really badly. So mm. I was not only able to manage the symptoms of the Ellers Danlos, but now I'm able to paint. Now I'm able to draw. Now I'm able to do the YouTube channel without, you know, being exhausted, <laughs> without yeah. wearing myself out. Um, for me, uh, what do I do for coping skills? Um, I find meditation helps. For a lot of people, prayer is the same version. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Reading, listening, whether that's reading braille books, whether that's, you know, if you're able to read large print. Um, I'm jealous because <laughs> I used to be able to. Um, whether it's braille or audiobooks, that's, that's a huge hit at the moment because of uh, the corona. Yeah, um, I love I- I don't know what I where I, right. I'm an avid audiobook. <laughs> I think I think I, I'm like I need to go buy stock and Audible, y'all. Because um. yeah, um, I deal with a lot of anxiety as well. Uh, yeah, with with the brain damage that I have, um, and then PTSD being a neurological disorder, not um, a mental disorder. A lot of people get that confused. Um, mm. You create a lot of anxiety uh, from the brain because there's the chemical imbalance. And then on top of that, the other stainless also causes anxiety. So there's a lot of, a lot, a lot going on in the brain there. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot to so manage. I, I also listen to music and a lot of people can't believe that, you know, deaf people listen to music, but yeah. <laughs> um, I singing also helps me as well. Um, mm-hmm. Being creative in other ways besides art, the YouTube channel, the editing formation of the YouTube channel the podcast, um, creating the thumbnails, creating logos, creating just different photos on, um, I use Canva. It's a, it's an app that I do too. you basically can just create anything on there, um, which is really cool. I think that's something that's been the most surprising to me as a blind YouTuber that I've enjoyed the most is zooming in so big and like you know it's funny I don't see resolution I have no idea if my pictures are in focus or not I oh I I know (laughs) you know it's kind of like my thumbnail when when everyone on YouTube is talking about oh your thumbnail is is important and y'all and I'm just like you know what um it's not gonna be perfect and I don't expect mine to be perfect because I'm a blind YouTuber but I have been so in thoroughly impressed and surprised how much that visual art of it, I do enjoy. I've never really been into that, but I can totally relate to you on that. Um, on this journey of YouTube, uh, creating thumbnails, I never realized was an art form. <laughs> and yeah. um, as frustrated as I get with it at times, I do kind of get lost in it as well. So. That yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be I'd be on like the Canva for like hours because I do different yeah. things with it. Um, yeah, I'd be on Thanks. it for hours and then my phone's dying and I'm like, oh, oh, and my husband's like, what's going on? I'm like, I killed my phone from being on Canva for too long. <laughs> He's like, again? <laughs> I was like, yeah. yeah. Um, so I found like different creative ways. Um, cooking also helps as well. Um, I've had to get a wheelchair to reserve my energy and that's helped a lot uh thankfully i don't i don't know what possessed me to come up with that idea but it helps Mm. um and i use the griddle so that it's easier for me to cook on it while i'm sitting um so i just yeah i just put that on the counter and then um i'm actually you know getting back into the hello fresh now that i'm able to afford it um but i i wouldn't mind doing like a an upload on that one as well because a lot of people ask if you're if you can only 
if you're only using two senses, how in the world are you cooking? <laughs> it's so interesting because the I, last. I, I mean, I I I even mentioned this in your last you know live. I only use my sense of smell and my sense of touch. I have a really really strong yes. sense of touch. Yes, I remember you in that chat because we that was on. Um, with my my blind mama's messy kitchen and yeah. how she cooks blind and stuff and when you said that you were deaf blind and that I was like oh wow because you know a lot of us who are blind cooks in the kitchen we do rely heavily on our not just our touch but our smell so right um but yeah with you you know not being able to hear is in addition to some of the, cause like I can hear when things are boiling and all right. that stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, it would, yeah, that blew my mind in the last chat. <laughs> so, it uh, Laura, what about you? As well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bet you need to do an upload on that. Oh for yeah. Sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, it's it, in listening, like it, it, when first diagnosed, um, you have to weed through, or I had to read through a lot of society's programming. Um, yeah, yes. I heard, yeah, I heard yeah. Jojo say um, she had to figure out what she couldn't do or could or couldn't do for herself. And for me, so much of that was actually figuring out what society had told me blind people couldn't do versus mm -hmm. what I could actually do versus what my body and its limitations with anxiety and psoriatic arthritis and um, lichens, what it can do, you know? And so um, that awareness didn't come to me until I was in community um, around other blind people who were, who, like I said, were having a positive experience with blindness. And so having friends that are willing to sort of like question some of my philosophy or, well, why can't you go there? You know, um, in the beginning, I wouldn't go out at night and, you know, in just talking to enough blind people and getting my o &M skills and learning how to be out in the world, you know, it's just one step at a time. Um, and so when I think of coping, it's like certainly one step at a time. It's getting community, getting peer support um, and questioning, questioning, everything. Our, our, we, we talk about our community like it's one cohesive unit. It's not. It's huge. There's thousands yeah. and hundreds of moving parts. And each of those parts has an opinion and a philosophy, and it may or may not match with yours. And so for myself, um, I unpacked the cane. A lot of feelings about a folding cane versus a straight cane. And in, on my consent soapbox and in blind positivity, it really doesn't matter which cane a person is using. If a blind or visually impaired person needs that as a mobility tool and they are on a journey towards using it, then, then I think everybody should just stop with their opinions. <laughs> and <laughs> it can be really, it can be really hard when, you know, society's told you one thing and then the community you're coming to has a lot of strong opinions. And so in the work that I do with our, um, transitional age youth, we actually talk a lot about this and the coping skills. And I will share a workshop that we do. Um, it basically is, we have them talking about microaggressions and the things that they hate experiencing out in the world, something that may make them not want to go out or not want to socialize or not want to go to a certain event. And we get them to be in little groups of about four or five and they discuss the microaggression and their reaction and how it makes them feel. And a lot of times they might be angry or defeated. They might not want to go out into the world, any number of things, but it's a reaction that they don't feel confident about. So we're having them work on something that they feel uncomfortable about. And then we, we have them talk and peer support and brainstorm other ways of being out in the world and one of the other things that happens a lot to us disabled folks, we are told how to behave or react. We are told to be nice mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. educate or to be kind or that that person was just trying to be helpful or don't be a B or whatever it might, mm -hmm. be, whatever it might be. And in consent culture, the entire plethora of responses is okay. And it is up to the person who's experiencing the consent violation 
to respond in a way that leaves them feeling safe and empowered and able to move through the world. And so in the second scenario, the youth work through the experience and they play out a more empowered response. And so something that, that leaves them feeling better about the situation. And we actually, um, in one case, received feedback from one of the teachers. This blind youth had come to our program not using their cane and they received a lot of um, teasing. You're not blind. Why do you need that cane? You don't look blind. And through this experience, they chose to educate. They had the, you know, the whole plethora of responses and they stopped and sort of used humor to educate these uh, in the scenario. They did that in real life and it actually really worked. And they developed a new peer group, started using their cane and simply by giving them the experience of working through a consent violation and giving them wow. some tools on how to respond, not micromanaging how they respond, giving them that full permission to have that response is so important. And so for myself, I was socialized as a good girl. I was socialized to be nice out in the world. And so I, you know, say, please don't touch me or can you please, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it might be. And while there's a time for nicety, there's also a time for me to say, you're making me uncomfortable, get your hands off. Um, right. And so, so much of having this conversation with folks and learning the tools that would make me more confident and independent out there and layering it with the conversation of consent, um, those two things I sort of feel like uh, I'm on an unstoppable fun journey out there right now. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think I totally agree with all of that. I think a lot of it is, you know, coping just a lot with anything in life, you know, starts with acceptance, self-awareness, uh, you know, bo both of you kind of touch, you know, um, under some of those big umbrella words right there. I think, um, yeah, a coping can can occur in on so many different ways. And I think community, like you said, Laura, is a huge one. You know, so many times, so many people think, you know, they have a very narrow view of what coping and, and developing, you know, whether it's a hobby or something, it's like this narrow view where it has to be X, Y, and Z. But there's so many ways that we can cope um you know with whatever it is on our plate whether it's just struggling with their disabilities whether it's trauma whether it's negative experiences just a or just a freaking bad day right i mean sometimes um coping can occur on so many different levels and boxing it in can really narrow your view and thus your efforts to cope because you feel like, well, I guess I'm having a bad day. So I just, I'm going to make everybody else miserable around me, you know, mm -hmm. kind of instead of, well, what can I do about it? What are some of the things that healthy choices, healthy decisions that I can do to help manage this and fix this? So I'm not making everyone miserable around me. Um, but, you know, oftentimes it's so easy to take that easy road and ignore it, deny it, avoid it, um, and keep our voices silent. So much of coping includes, like you were touching on, Laura, self-advocacy and speaking up and learning to find your voice and to say, and, and to to not box it in and have a narrow view of what that needs to look like by saying it like you were saying and not being a nice girl. We don't always have to be that mm -hmm. nice person. The, I mean, we ha you need to come forward with what the situation demands. And mm -hmm. when you are coping with um, JoJo, like you have so many uh, different competing disabilities, conditions, and diagnoses going on there, I mean, it's like, I, I lost my train of thought there, but <laughs> I'm, I'm so tired, y'all. It's like almost midnight here. Um, <laughs> we've been going for a while. But JoJo, like you were saying, it's just when you have so much competing there, knowing and having the self-awareness, having to, the, the strength that it takes to speak up, and to not be afraid to say, yeah, I've got a mental illness, blah, 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 you know, but 
that takes strength. It takes bravery because so much in our society teaches us the negative stigma of those first. And it's really hard to retrain our brains to do so and to think in broader terms and more accepting terms um, that allows us to get to those healthy places um, easier. Ladies, I'm going to kind of bring this evening to a close. I want to thank you both so much for joining me. I want to do more one-on-one -on -one conversations with you guys because I think this definitely needs to be discussed a lot more, especially this this month and, and these coming years as we get out of COVID and, and, and just bring some more education to our communities. But I want to allow you guys to have a few moments um, to bring any closing thoughts. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining me this evening and make sure you remember to check the description box for more information and details. So, uh, Jojo, uh, why don't you take us off with any in, any final thoughts and then we'll end with you, Laura. Um, thing that I, I want to mention is um, if, you know, people just need to learn for this in the talk. Um, I am a central care support specialist as, as well as a recovery support specialist. I am a recovery mentor. Um, and I've done a lot of local support groups uh, in my time. <laughs> um, so, if you know we feel the need to talk to someone that you know has you know has the experience literally um you guys can you know uh, what do you feel free to send me at the end of the uh give uh, yeah oh say uh say it now or should i just say to you know and you <laughs> I can barely hear you, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, the better one. Sort of. I'm sorry? We can barely hear you. <laughs> Jojo, it may have been from your headphones. I was just thinking about that. Um. Well, I can't, I can't think that I'm on my own. Okay, hold on. That's, I mean, that's okay. I mean, if we want, if Laura, you want to um, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, Again, my name is Laura Millar, and that's spelled with an A-R-M-I-L-L-A-R. -L -L um, and you can find me on Facebook at Blindness um, and Sexuality. That's actually Blindness Ampersand Sexuality. We have a Facebook page there. And then also, um, I'm one of the lead investigators on the Blind Positive Sex Ed team. And we hold conversations in community about um, accessible sex education. We, you know, uh, solicit the community's feedback and um, experience with sex education, and then are working to turn that into recommendation for educators and a curriculum. So if folks are interested in following along um, the work that we are doing, it is an all community led project and you can find us at Blind Positive Sex Ed um, on Facebook and also on Clubhouse. Awesome. That is awesome. I, I need to get on Clubhouse. I'm still like behind <laughs> on the times with Clubhouse. Um, but thank you so much. I so appreciate both of you all joining me this evening. I hope anyone out there gained some value from tonight's discussion. And make sure you check out these ladies' websites that you will find in the description box down below later on once I add them. So um, be sure to keep tuning in. Hit subscribe, all that good jazz down below. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. I will try to add chapters in the 
description box as well since this was a lengthy conversation so that way that will help you navigate this conversation as well but um, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off thank you all so much for joining and uh, we'll see you in the next blind community chat awesome thank you mm -hmm. bye bye